welcome to an on-camera edition of The Conversation. I'm Nubi Ratto. The Conversation, we're going to talk to different candidates about different issues that are going on in the city. There's a huge election coming up on September 1st. So I wanted to bring some candidates who are running for uh, state senator. We're here with the, the incumbent, Mike Brady. Uh, Mike, first, thanks for coming on The Conversation. Thank you for inviting me. Mike, uh, you've been involved in politics forever. Actually, I first met you um, at the Keep Brockton Beautiful event back when you were the War II uh, city councilor, so so yes. way back when. So I've been knowing you for years. So uh, seems like yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have a few more gray hairs, and I put on little pounds, but I I tend to lose a little weight during the campaign trail. So I try to eat healthy and get out on the trail, knocking on doors and meeting with the residents. Right, right. It's definitely um you know it's definitely going to be a, a tough campaign season, especially now with you know COVID nineteen and everything. It's a little different. Yeah. This year, definitely different world we're living in. You know, um, Mike. You know, for people who don't know you, um, I, I just kind of want to you know give give people a chance to know who you are in terms of how you get into politics and so forth. Just kind of give us a brief history of how you got into politics and, and now your current state senator. Sure. Well, I've been born and raised in the city of Brockton. I grew up not too far on Pleasant Street from here. Uh, I'm the youngest out of three. My mother and father raised a family on Pleasant Street. Before I was born, they lived over the east side. I grew up near the m, &M Market on Pleasant Street there. And, you know, my, my sister was had moved on. She had her own family, lived in Whitman. My brother had his own family. And... I had worked, uh, you know, I'd gone to Massaway Community College right after high school. I had worked at Superior Bakery back then, worked at McMenemy's Fish Market before that. I ended up uh, going back to school at Massasoit, and then I transferred and got into the insurance business. I was working at, after Superior at Milan News Agency, delivering magazine newspapers all over the South Shore, a lot of the towns that I represent now. And I was always looking to better myself, so I trained for Metropolitan Life, went to school, got my degrees for their college in Rhode Island started selling life insurance and health insurance and uh, disability income insurance. And then I started my own business in 1995, Brady Insurance. But I always was very caring about the community where I was raised and born. And um, a friend of mine or many friends kept saying, Mike, you're always talking about Brock this, Brock that, why don't you run for office? And I, prior to that, I had gotten involved with a neighborhood crime watch group in my neighborhood because I lived at home with my father. My mother had passed away. He had had two strokes, and some neighbors of mine were broken into. You know, if anyone broke into my father's home, he couldn't defend himself with the strokes. So we got a neighborhood crime watch together. We started other neighborhood crime watches. I got involved with Save Our Libraries, a volunteer for that. And so I decided to run for office, and I ran for the school committee in 1995. And I was elected and uh, worked on getting some more funding for the schools. I was uh, deciding to vote on teachers' contracts. And then we moved on to the city council when my predecessor, Tom Pluff, was appointed to a city solicitor job. It was a special election. There were some great candidates back then. I won that seat. And uh, we were able to get some funding for our schools back then. We got 90% reimbursement to build five elementary schools in Brockton. No other community had gotten that. And we had a voluntary desegregation plan. No other community had got the funding. And most of our schools were diversified, but two weren't. That's how we got the funding. And we continued to get funding. The economy was good. We built a um, council on aging named after Mary Kennedy, Tom Kennedy's mother, the Mary Kennedy Senior Center. That was done with state lottery funding when Shannon O'Brien was a treasurer. I was a big library supporter. We put a big addition on our downtown library. And the governor at the time, um, Salucci had cut the funding. We went and lobbied the legislature, got the funding for our library, and it, and it was a beautiful historic building built with a Carnegie grant in the early 1900s, but it was never handicap accessible. So never mind our former state senator, Tommy Kennedy, couldn't get in there, but a young child who was handicapped couldn't get in there unless you carried him in there. So things were doing good, you know, the economy was doing good, and then um, when Tommy Kennedy moved on to become the senator, Bobby Creed was a clerk of courts. I had a lot of support to run for the state House of Representatives seat. And I was very successful. Two other good candidates were running, and um, I had tremendous support from my community. And that was called the 9th Plymouth District, which just encompassed Brockton. In the meantime, I was involved with the Democratic State Committee, which encompasses the Senate district I served. I was also on the Plymouth County Democratic League. So I got to know the towns that I represent now, and I had family from these towns. I, my aunt and uncle raised their family in Hanson. My aunt originally came from Hanover. My sister lived in Whitman. So I had a lot of knowledge of these towns. Plus, working at Milan News and even Superior Baker, and my brother delivered to these towns. I got to know these towns like the back of my hand. So when I ran for the Senate seat, a lot of people, you know, Tommy Kennedy had passed, unfortunately, and, and uh, he was a great mentor and, and supporter of mine. But we lost a great advocate for the community in Tommy Kennedy. So a lot of people had come to me asking me to run for that seat. And I had tremendous support. I had a Republican opponent that year, 
and there was another opponent. But uh, again, knowing the, the communities like the back of my hand, being born and raised in the community, being active in a lot of initiatives, um, I was successful in that seat. And we worked to get funding into the district, Chapter 90 money for roads. That's how we get Belmont Street done, Route 123. I represent these other towns as well. We get money for Hanover and Hanson, uh, road money. We also, uh, more recently in the Senate, passed the Student Opportunity Act, which is a highest increase of funding in the history of the Commonwealth. To and this and I, know, I, know I want to touch upon that a little later, but I, I do want to touch upon, I want to get right into the issues. Yes. We don't have much time. I want to, um, and I will get into the Student Opportunity Act. I do want to get into the, the hot button issue and the bill that's um, been in use for the last few weeks, the police reform bill. Um, talk about where is it right now. Um, you know, I, I know it went through the Senate. I know it's in sure. the House right now. Yes. What's the process of that? Well, and um, let's talk about some things you agree and disagree with. Right. On the it's, bill. In, it's in what's called the Commerce Committee. And every bill and every piece of legislation that's filed between the House and the Senate, if there's any differences, it goes to what's called the Commerce Committee. And there's three members of the House and three members of the Senate who make a final decision. So we filed amendments and supported some amendments. Some of the things that we didn't like about the bill, the qualified immunity, we tried to take that out of there to have more studying and more advocacy on behalf Ex of that. Explain what that is. And that, that is a uh, proposal that's in, like I have a portion of qualified immunity as an elected official, but I'm still held to a higher accountability. And, and you've seen that in my whole life, in my personal life. If anybody does anything wrong outside of their job, they can all be sued and held accountably. But in their line of work, they have what's called qualified immunity. And again, I'm not in a union. I, I'm a big union supporter, but as an elected official, I'm not in a union. So my qualified immunity is different than what a municipal a state of a federal employee has. But this was a protection from civil liability lawsuits. And so we tried to take that out of there to have more um, knowledge and information on that part. There was other parts of the bill that I supported There's the, in the Senate version. I can't speak for the House version. There was $5 million of additional training funding for the um, Senate reform bill that was passed. And, and that's important because we've got to make sure that the police have their resources. There was also about forming commissions and so forth to have some police officers on these commissions, but also have people from the community, members of the NAACP on these boards, citizens who are active on the boards. I did ask, though, we want to make sure that people on these commissions and, and, and committees have training and want to know, you know, how police works. And nobody can tell a police officer how they work better than a police officer who was in the streets and in the field. But, you know, there was a lot of issues that came up to, to lead this to come to fruition. And it wasn't even just the George Floyd case, which has hit the media over the past year or so. But, you know, D.J. Henry, who, who lived in Easton, now this did not happen in Massachusetts, but... Uh, he was killed in New York outside of Pace University. And that issue rose. And there's things all over the country. Now, we have better laws and protection in Massachusetts and different laws than other states may have. But you want to make sure that the police have proper training and certification. And every town is different. Like chokeholds was a big issue with, with what happened to Mr. Floyd. Well, I found out that Brockton doesn't teach their police officers to do chokeholds. And there's other things that we don't do, but every town is different. The, you know, the city of Springfield has many different issues than the city of Brockton or the town of Hannah or Hanson that I represent. What are you hearing from your constituents, um, particularly um, in Brockton, about uh, the police reform bill, um, particularly well, the, the minority community? Well, what are you hearing from Well, them? I haven't heard a lot from the uh, community. I, I met with them myself, though. I reached out to them. Mm -hmm. I met with people from the African-American community. I met with parishioners from the church community in Brockton. I met with leaders and people who are involved with the NAACP in Brockton. And I also listened to police officers as well. And there was a lot of things, that were, when the leadership put this bill forward, they said, you know, we asked about public hearings and so forth. They said there was five compilations of bills that were put into one bill at the final day there. And they said they had public hearings on those bills. Now, Public hearings, because of COVID, is a little different than they were before. We'd get everybody in the state house, et cetera. Now you've got to do through things through Zoom. And I know today we're, we're meeting six feet apart for safe distancing. That's why we don't have to wear the mask. But, you know, because of COVID, we're meeting through Zoom meetings. So people are sending correspondence by emails and from phone calls and so forth. But I reach out to the people in the, in the public. And I've met with people in Brockton, in Hanson, in Halifax. I, during the night of those bills being proposed and that final bill being proposed, 
I listened to chiefs from every community in the amendments that they asked me to file that was uh, beneficial. Some of the police officers and some of the public agreed on some parts of the bill. And I felt we could have moved forward with the parts that everybody agreed on. And then the confusion and the disagreements, we could have worked on that later on. Um, cause, so that's why myself and some other senators supported some amendments to try to take the disparities out of there, moving into a, a more thorough discussion process on that, get the things we agreed on. Everybody agrees there should be more training. Everybody agrees that there should be more funding. Everybody agrees, and there was nothing in there to defund police. And I know there's a lot of talk in the, in the public while resources should go to other, other avenues like mental illness. We have passed legislation and put more money into helping people address the mental health issues out there. And that's a whole nother ball game. But for, for this specific thing, it's having communication in the public and relating to the public and training and everything else. And there is issues about racial bias out there and so forth. So that's why I listen to people from my community. And that's why the bill was first proposed. We didn't get everything right in the Senate. We figured we'd wait to see what happened in the House of Representatives. They have their own version. And now it's in a conference committee. And we're waiting to see what comes out of the conference committee because we have another vote in it. When it comes out of the conference committee, then it goes to the governor if it votes favorably then he could veto some things and it could come back to us for another final vote. So there's okay. a, another lengthy process to go through. I just wanted to give you a chance to clear that up. I know it's been you know, a big thing in the news. I do, I do want um, to, obviously you have an opponent, Moses Rodriguez. What separates you from Moses? Well, you know, everybody has a right to run out there. This is a part of democracy in our country. I've had opponents before and sometimes I haven't had any opponents, but you know, my opponent decided to run for office. He has every right to do so. Um, I think what separates me, the biggest thing is my work experience and in my work ethic. Uh, I'm at every community meeting. I've been in meetings in Brockton and Ward 4 to deal with some development that the residents were against down there that was on the East Bridgewater line. I've been up at the Braymore Nursing Home. There was a meeting at the Han Hancock School recently. The residents were about traffic and issues there. I'm constantly out there meeting with the public in the towns I represent. And I know these towns like the back of my hand as well as the city of Brockton. I was born and raised in Brockton, but as I mentioned, I had relatives in these towns. I've done business in these towns. I've worked with the elected officials. And, and the other thing is I've had endorsements by just about every elected official in the towns, some of the city councils in Brockton, some former mayors, and also my fellow colleagues in the state house, Senator, I mean, State Representative Claire Cronin and Representative Jerry Cassidy, and um, my chairman of Ways and Means, Mike Rodericks, who I'm on the Ways and Means Committee, he knows the work ethic I have. And you've got to work together with people to get things done. And I've delivered. I've gotten more funding, as I mentioned, for the schools in Brockton. We've gotten money for the opioid addiction crisis. That's, that's facing every community, whether you're in a wealthy part of the district or you're in the poorest parts of the district. Every family is affected by that. I've got money for road construction. And we've increased funding through local aid every single year. And then the COVID hit. And we're dealing with a serious epidemic, as we heard on the news, the numbers are starting to go up again, not just Brockton, but as you know, Brockton was the second highest uh, a number of cases in the Commonwealth outside of Boston. And our nursing homes were devastated. I met with our healthcare facilities. I met with our nurses. They're on the frontline workers, our firefighters. I went with a firefighter right when it happened to visit, and we put the N95 mask on, to visit all our healthcare and our hospitals. The, the Good Samaritan, the Signature Healthcare, which is a Brockton House with the Neighborhood Health Center. And we listen to the healthcare workers. Because out of Washington, and I'm not blaming our congressional delegation, they do a great job, but that person who sits in the White House, he was in denial that there was even a COVID crisis. You know, um, Bob Kraft from the Patriots got a first plane uh, load of equipment into the area. New York was the hottest hit. He got equipment to Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. Then the second plane, the president diverted back to Washington. That's not right. And that's why I, I can't wait till we get a new president in this uh, United States of America too, who can work with our delegation to get things done. So we ended up passing some legislation, got some funding to the district to help with COVID related for PPEs, et cetera. And I also know that our county commission has got $93 million and I've been at different town meetings when they've been able to distribute the checks to whether it be the town of East Bridgewater they gave two checks to, uh, I was at a thing down in Plimpton, which is part of my district yesterday. The firefighters sent in an application, the fire chief, and uh, they were able to get some money for that. And we got to continue to work on that case. Um, the big, the big buzzword I'm hearing from state rep candidates, from from uh, your opponent, is bringing in the bacon. Right. How do you bring in the bacon? How do you bring in the money to the, to the city? Well, Talk about some of the things that going forward, of of ways that you're going to bring 
um, new money to the city. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you had a few meetings. Of, you know, talk about some things that, yeah, that you're like, thinking of. Yeah, like we, each senator has allocated a certain amount of money. And Brockton has always got an increase in their school funding every year. Is it enough? Of course not. We have a very diverse population. We're not a wealthy community. We need the resources. So through that Student Opportunity Act, that, that was the highest increase in student funding in the history of the Commonwealth for the city of Brockton and for other communities such as Brockton. Uh, I know New Bedford, my opponent mentions, got more money in the budget than we did in Brockton, but Brockton always got a ton more money than New Bedford. It was even the playing field out, so they did get a little bit more money to even the playing field, but Brockton still gets a ton more money than New Bedford does. And that's why I've worked with the New Bedford Senator. He's supported me, Mark Montigny. I've worked with other legislators, and in life, whether you're in the private sector or the public sector, you gotta work together, you build up relationships. I've got legislation passed. Even in the budget, I got $50,000 for the Haitian community in Brockton. That's working together with leadership and they, they, they allocated $500,000. We got money even for the golf course in Brockton to help clean up that and, and some of the road work up at DW Fields Park. You talked about new, um, new revenue coming to the city. You did mention it in a debate um, about uh, Gambling, fan, yes. uh, football, fancy yes. football, and I do want to get your opinion on casinos. Talk mm -hmm. about, um, mm -hmm. let's talk about gambling first. How did that bring into the money into the city? And then do you see a casino come in into Brockton well, anytime the, soon? Well, when the initial law got passed at the state level, there was a, a proposal that got passed, three casinos in one slot power. So they have one casino up in the North Shore, one in the western part of the state on Springfield, in Regency, which is in the South Shore. Mm -hmm. And it can go to Brockton. I know Taunton's applied for it. William has applied for it. That is still an open process, it, but it's up to the Gaming Commission to decide. And I do support getting a third casino in Regency, wherever they decide, the revenue, the jobs. And I've seen what happened in the area in Springfield. It's cleaned up a tremendous area, depending where it goes. I know some people up the west side are concerned if it goes in the fairgrounds. That's not the only proposal, though. They're proposing to do Taunton or, or Wareham. The other thing is the slot parlor went down a plane ridge, so that's already done. The other thing, though, that's not the only source of revenue. Uh, the fair share amendment, and this is, uh, we don't agree to put a tax on you and I, people who are making average incomes. I'm talking about the millionaires out there. Anybody who makes above and beyond a million dollars, and this happened during the Eisenhower administration, who was a Republican president, that's how he got all the highway systems done. He taxed the wealthiest part of the population. We have a proposal, we sent out surveys, the majority of the public supports it. Anybody making over a million dollars, the first million they get taxed at the regular level, above and beyond that million dollars, so the second and third million they make, they get taxed at a higher level. That will help ease the burden on the local people like you and I, get more money into the district and help suffice our budget. Plus, the other idea we have is fantasy sports. Now, I don't do it. Everybody I know, they go uh, half a ride to Rhode Island, they go to New Hampshire, they have it legalized. I think it's time to do so. It's a way to get more revenue. You know, they can bet on sports games and everything else, and that's a way to get more revenue into the Commonwealth. And people are doing it anyway. They go to these other states, and the, you'll see Massachusetts cars in these other states. That revenue can be put back into Massachusetts, and that's another way of jobs. And with technology, which... Uh, you know, I, I mentioned I'm lucky I know how to use a cell phone and, and emails and so forth. But that's what all the young people do. They interact through emails and all the technology. It's, it's, it's way overdue to do that. And, and I've talked to my constituents. There's overwhelming support on fantasy sports and sports betting. A couple of years ago, the state approved to legalize marijuana. Um, the complaint is that, you know, it still needs to be opened up to more, uh, more minority owners. Mm -hmm. um, Talk about what can you do as a state senator to open up the process more to get um, more minorities involved mm -hmm. in, in, in legalized marijuana. Well, that, you know, the voters supported that to legalize marijuana overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. The first proposals were for medical marijuana. We had one down on West Chestnut Street. I haven't heard any complaints about them. Sometimes traffic was a concern, but they're, they're very, you have to have a strict thing to get in and out of there. You have to have your license, be over 21 years of age, and so forth. So as far as how many in, in how many licensed places are available, it's left up to the community. Some communities such as Brockton, the council approved a certain number of uh, facilities. Some towns didn't want it. It's left up to the local communities. And again, in the first proposal, the council had a proposal to approve a certain amount of licenses, but there was no minority businesses that were approved during that case. So they reopened up the case, I believe, and I think there was one minority business that's opening up not too far from me on Pleasant Street. And again, 
it, no matter who it is, you have to have all your ducks in order, you have to have all your T's crossed and your I's dotted and have the proper paperwork done for the applications. And again, it's left up to the city council. I know there was a little bit of bumps in the road. I know one of our councils tried to walk through the process to get them um, doing the right thing. They did put it off for one week, but I believe that that new owner is approved can, now. Can something be done at the state level to open up that process more to... Well, I think it's, it's a good process and it is open to the public right okay. now. And anybody who has all the legal documentation in place, they can apply. And I, again, I, what I've heard from the councils, because again, it's a local decision, not up to us, but they had so many applications that were applied and they approved based on the number of applications, based on... It's almost like, not to use the analogy with liquor licenses, but liquor licenses is only so many that are approved in a community. That's left up to the local community on, on the, um, the, the marijuana facilities as well. And again, I think that they finally helped get that, uh, I think it's a female business, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Yes, yes. So it'll help a female minority business, but that helped her get going and get all the paperwork done, and she is moving forward. And I know they're doing the construction as I drove by here coming downtown today. I uh, know we touched upon it earlier, but I do want to talk about it more in detail, the Student Opportunity Act. Mm -hmm. um, just talk about what's coming to brought the next couple of years, because it sounds like some really good news. Well, well this is huge, it. and this just didn't happen overnight. You know, in 1993, the Ed Reform Act passed. That helped the city of Brockton out, but there was some criteria. You had to have MCAS testing. And, you know, I've talked to teachers and educators. They're the experts in the field. You didn't want to just keep teaching to the test. And I know that they had to test. And I, I tell you, I'll be honest, I have a tough time passing tests. Amen. Um, so, you, you know, you want to make sure that students are properly educated so they're prepared to go out into the workforce in the real world afterwards. But the, the, the Edward Film Act wasn't perfect. So that's where we came up with the Student Opportunity Act. And this just doesn't help out the city of Brockton. It helps up a lot of other towns. There's a lot of work that went into it. We had our educators, the chairman of education in the Senate of the House, come to Brockton. They visited uh, Superintendent Kathy Smith at the time. Mike Thomas came on board afterwards. We visited the high school. We visited the Kennedy School. And my, my uh, prayers go out to Mr. Rogan's family, who just passed away, the principal of the Kennedy School. But we visited and listened to our local officials. There were school members who showed up in some of the city councils. Not every city council was there. I know their schedules are busy. But this was so important. We listened to the stakeholders. Plus, we had elected officials who came into the state house. We always had an open door policy there, of course, until the COVID hit. Now it's a, you know, you got to do safe distancing. Right. But we had local officials from Brockton visit in the state house and express their needs. And we worked on this with the legislators, working together, Republicans and Democrats. And that's how we come up with this legislation, which passed last year. Highest increase in funding ever in the history of the Commonwealth, which is great news. Unfortunately, COVID hit. So we still have not decreased funding. Because of COVID, we had to do supplemental budgets as we're going along. We're still waiting for the federal government. Uh, we passed the budget to go through the month of October. But we still did pass an annual budget for the schools to do level funding plus adjustments for inflation. So we did get more money for Brockton this year. And it's until the federal government comes up. I know the federal Congress passed a $3 trillion package. The U.S. Senate has not. And I know our two U.S. Senators are working on Mark and Warren trying to get more money, but some of these other Senators that represent other parts of the country, they weren't in agreement, but now they're moving closer to the middle. Let me ask you a question. Um, when, when you have to vote on a difficult bill that's controversial, how do you go about making a decision process? You talk to people, do you pray about it? What, what, what's your process of, of getting and making that decision well, well, on a controversial you, bill? You, you brought up a great um, analogy. I, I talk to everybody I can. That's why the cliche, we got two ears and one mouth, we're supposed to listen. And I reached out to a church community in Brockton. And I've, I've gotten calls from people in my community. I've gotten calls from police officers. There's a wide variety of differences of opinion on this bill. And it's, and it's very difficult to understand and comprehend because it was 170 plus pages in the bill itself. Then we filed 173 pages of amendments. That's different than the House version. So anything that the police officers in the community asked me to put in for amendments, I supported. Not everyone passed. So we wanted to see what the House version is, and it's in a conference committee. You know, this isn't a, a bill to take away and hurt any police officers out there. It's, you know, the $5 million of training is to protect officers and protect the public. And you want both hands to work together. So I listen to people. I'm still listening to them. I'm reaching out to them. I've sent copies of the legislation to people that have asked for it. And again, not everybody understands everything because you get, 
you know, the cliche, you get two lawyers in a room and they're going to have three differences of, of opinion on what's in a piece of legislation. And it's very difficult to everybody to understand. And right. I've had the experts working with me on this. And you mentioned, do I pray? Of course I do. Um, I'll tell you uh, a story in my life that I, I pray quite often uh, and I don't like to just be, uh, I have that guilt as a Catholic Christian that um, you shouldn't just pray when you want something or whatever because you have that guilt. But I, I pray a lot from you know, people who are sick out there and pray for my own family. I lost my brother recently in May. But I also do pray to try to make the right decisions in decision making. And several years ago, I had a debate with a tough opponent and I said a prayer before the debate. And when I come out, it was with the Brockton Interfaith community back in the day, and I've had a lot of support within their community. But um, my opponent didn't show up, and I never realized he was just as nervous as I was. And you don't realize that we're, a lot of us are more alike than you realize. And, you know, that doesn't mean every prayer is answered. Of course, like when we were kids, we'd, we might say a prayer, we get the right toy as a gift, and if your parents can't afford it, you may not get the one you want. But... Um, I do pray a lot because I want to make the right decisions. And there is some very difficult decisions we make. And, you know, sometimes you make decisions. You don't want to lose any friendships over this. I've, I've broken bread with a lot of these people that this is affected by. But the big thing in the bill, not all of qualified communities is taken out of the bill. Plus, they have what's called indemnification, which makes somebody old. Because I've had wives of police officers come to me. Mike, am I going to be sued and lose my house and lose my, my husband's life savings or my spouse's savings, my pension? And again, it only goes after the worst of the worst. 99.9% .9 of the police officers out there are our friends. They do their job. They work very efficiently. They need more resources, and we provide that as best we can. But they have to go through a lengthy process of decertification and all that before they even get to the spot. I want to give you, a, we have a few minutes left. I want you to give a final pitch on why people should vote for you on September 1st. So look at that camera and, and ask the viewers why they should, Thank you, Newby. Why well, should support you. As you all know, my name is Mike Brady. No, most of the people out in the public know me. Uh, I've, I've been around a long time, born and raised in the community. I'm asking for your vote on September 1st, and I thank those who've already voted. They, they've sent in applications. We are doing mail-in ballots as we speak. We are also doing early voting seven days before September 1st. Most of the public knows me. They know my work ethic. Uh, it's 24-7. Uh, my whole theme is Brady Works. I've been out there in the public. I was raised in a blue-collar family, um, and I will continue to work for my district. And I've reached out. I've gotten funding for... Uh, Council on Aging's down in Halifax. I got money for the Silver Lake Water District. I got money for road construction. I'm a big environmental supporter. We passed legislation to protect our environment, even fighting against the fossil fuel power plant in Brockton. But there's more work we need to do. We passed, I'm on the Veterans Committee. We passed the Welcome Home Bill and the Valor Act 1 and 2. I also got a bill supporting veterans to help out small businesses, to start and help small businesses out. And number one uh, concerns recently is unemployment. The federal government is, is coming up with the decision, are they going to continue to fund that? But we are there to help the community. We are there to work for you as our constituents. And my office has done a yeoman's work helping out. 90% of the calls I've gotten is getting people help with their unemployment. And you are welcome to call me anytime, 617-722-1200, 722-1200. And michael.brady at masenate.gov is my website. I'm there to work for you. I'm, I'm always available 24-7. And like we're meeting in downtown studios today, I'll meet people at the local coffee shops. I'll meet them in Boston, Brockton, and Halifax, Plimpton, Hanover, wherever the need may be. And as you know, I, I kid about it. I was, I'm still single. If I was ever married, I'd be divorced already because I'm never home in this business. But... My life in, in my job is my family, and, and that's what I do 24-7. I want to continue to work for you. My work ethic speaks for itself, and I am very grateful for all the support that I've had out there, and I thank all the supports, all the endorsements I had, not only from elected officials, the mass teachers, the mass nurses, and the uh, iron workers, and the, all the local unions, the Brockton Labor Council, the SEIU 888. I wouldn't be here without their support, and that's us working all together. Mike, thank you so much. Wish you the best luck on September 1st. Thank you. You're watching The Conversation. We'll be back with more candidates after this. Thank you very much.